So question number five asks you to solve not one inequality, but rather the result of combining two inequalities together into a compound inequality. Um, and the significance of that compounding cannot be understated. This is something that's very easy to gloss over mentally as you're looking at a problem like this. So here we have a, a, the first inequality, 3w plus 5 is less than or equal to negative 1. We have the second inequality, 4w plus 4 is less than 20. And then in between those two inequalities, we have this all-important connector, this logical word or. Um, and our solution to this problem is going to have to contend with all three of those different things. Um, but let's take them one step at a time. Focusing first on the inequality 3w plus 5 is less than or equal to negative 1. How would you solve that inequality? What was your strategy? Brian? What I did was I made the 5. I did, I did 3w plus 5, negative 5, to cancel out that 5. Okay. I took it to the other side. Gotcha. So you're treating it as though it were an equation, which is what we want to do. Right? Treat an inequality like it's an equation. Um, so the same steps, the same reverse order of operations, sad MEP, that we would use in order to solve this if it were just an equation is how we would approach this as an inequality. So subtracting 5 from both sides leaves you with 3w on the left and less than or equal to, and on the right, negative 1 minus 5, negative 6. Okay, and then what happens next? Then I divide the 3. Divide the 3. Itself. Right, and that will get w by itself. And a negative 2 on the right-hand side. And so now is when I ask, whoops, negative 2. What happens with this inequality sign right here? Less than or equal to, or do we want to flip it? Why does it stay the same? There we go. So the only wrinkle in, the, in the, the, the strategy for solving an inequality that makes it different from solving an equation is that from time to time, we have to reverse the inequality symbol when we do certain steps, but only steps that have the effect of reversing the entire ordering on the number line. And the ordering on the number line only reverses in solving a, an algebraic, a linear inequality, if we multiply or if we divide by a negative number. If we multiply or divide by a negative number, the sign will flip. The sense of the inequality will flip. Here we didn't do that. We divided by a positive. That was positive. And so we don't need to flip in this example. But if we did divide by a negative number, we would need to flip the sense of this inequality. So that's the only additional thing to keep on your radar screen when solving linear inequalities that make them slightly different from solving linear equations. So with that being said, maybe we can solve this second inequality in the same way without dwelling as much on the details. If I'm solving 4w plus 4 is less than 20, what's my first step? Subtract 4 from both sides. That will give me 4w is less than 16. And my last step, divide by 4. Do I need to flip the sense of this inequality? No, because, because I divided by a positive 4. Exactly. So we will leave that inequality as w is less than 4. Great. So now we've solved each of the pieces of this inequality separately. And now is when we need to be very careful about how these two inequalities are being glued together, how they are being compounded. So this word or in between these two inequalities remains into our final answer. So some of you on the exam successfully navigated the steps that we have on the screen so far. Solved the inequality, solved one of the inequalities, and then solved the other inequality, um, and then ended up with an answer that looked like this. w is less than or equal to negative 2, or w is greater than 4, and you didn't simplify it from there. But there's a missing step. The answer to an inequality problem should be a set of real numbers. Um, and here we kind of have a set that's not completely simplified. We're describing the set, if we're using English words here, as the set of all numbers w, which are either less than or equal to negative 2, or they're less than 4. But there's a simpler way to describe that set of real numbers, and our job is to find it. 
So it's a process of simplifying, not simplifying an expression or simplifying a, 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 you know, a number or something, but rather to simplify this set. So we have to think about what that means. Let me uh, go up into this corner over here for a second. My strong recommendation when working a problem like this is to sketch out your sets on a number line to help you think about what's really going on here. So I'm just going to take a moment to do that. So here's my num real number line, and I've called out the numbers negative 2 and 4 on it. And so far, the inequalities that we've solved have given us two regions on this number line, the region of numbers which are less than or equal to negative 2, and those numbers I'm going to find over here. Starting from negative 2 and then going to the left. How do I know I'm going to the left, by the way? Well, because, because our 2 is negative, that means I'm starting at the value of 2, which is to the left of 0. How do I know that I'm shading all the numbers to the left of negative 2? Because right, because I have a less than or equal to. And less than or equal to means further to the left on the number line than negative 2. So the less than or equal to tells me to start from negative 2 and go to the left on the number line. Um, I also want to do something to this picture to indicate that negative 2 itself actually is a solution of this inequality, right? If I put a negative 2 in here for w, negative 2 is less than or equal to negative 2. Is that a true statement? Yes. Yeah, it is. Why? Right, because this little horizontal line underneath the less than sign indicates that we're going to allow for the possibility of being equal to negative 2. So negative 2 is included in my set. So how do we usually denote that if we're just sketching it on a number line the way that I'm doing here? Yeah, we're going to shade in a solid circle right here at negative 2. So I'm going to use a little solid circle to indicate that equals 2 is a part of this uh, part of my solution. So I'm going to put a solid dot at negative 2 and then shade everything to the left. So that's my first inequality. If I do the same thing with my second inequality, w is less than 4, I'm going to start at 4. Which way am I going to go, left or right? w is less than 4. Yeah, since w is less than 4, I also again want to go to the left. Uh, so starting from 4 and shading everything to the left of 4. And now, do I want to include 4 or do I want to not include 4? Why not? Yeah, here, if I put actual 4 in for w, I get a statement which is not true. 4 is not, in fact, less than 4. So how do we indicate that on my picture? Yeah, instead of a closed dot there, I'm going to put an open dot to indicate that we're not including 4 in that purple set. So, so far, our work has given us two sets. A green set, w less than or equal to negative 2, that we've shaded up here. Also, a purple set, W is less than 4, which we've shaded over here. But our job now is to combine those two sets together using the operation that we call a logical OR. So how do we do that? How does OR turn these two sets into a single set? What do I want to do with them? If you watch the explainer video, you might know the answer to this. The story is different if I have an or in that spot versus if I have an and in that spot. Those are our two possibilities for logical connectors. The process we used to do with or, it would be like, I think, a less than, whereas and would be like an equal sign. Okay. So um, in, a, in, in a... The word if and only if would be something different. Okay. Right. So in a course that dwells on logical topics, such as foundations of logical reasoning, or um, in our curriculum we have a selected topics, um, mathematical thought and practice course, or is what's sometimes called an inclusive quantifier. It takes everything which belongs to either of those sets and it combines it all together into one big set. So or means pile everything together. Glue these two sets together and take everything. Everything which is either purple or green or possibly both. So if I want the or, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the elements that belong to both of my sets and consider all of them together. So for my or, or acts like glue. We're just going to glue both of these things together. And when I glue both of these sets together, what do I end up with? Yeah. 
I end up with a set which includes not only everything from negative 2 to the left, because that belongs to the green set, but it also includes everything from negative 2 to 4, because that belongs in the purple set. It doesn't include 4, because that belongs to neither set, and it doesn't include anything bigger than 4, because that belongs to neither set as well. But an or is going to pick up everything which belongs to one set or the other or both. So it really does just take those two sets on my number line, sticks them together, and that's a sketch of my final answer, that red set beginning from 4 and continuing to the left. Let's imagine we had and instead of or. So I'm just going to kind of recreate what we had here. So we had negative 2, we had positive 4. My first set was negative 2, everything to the left, with a filled in circle because we're including negative 2. My second set was 4 and everything to its left, but not including 4 itself because it was a strict inequality, less than 4. Um, if instead of or, we had and. In order to belong to an and, a number has to satisfy both of my inequalities. Or was permissive. Right? It didn't care if you belonged to one or the other or both. As long as you were in at least one of the original sets, then you survive into your final answer. But for the and, it's really strict. The and means you have to belong to both sets. So instead of gluing the two sets together, what we're doing is looking for their overlap. So when you see the word and, think overlap, because that's what we're looking for here. In the and, or the logical conjunction of these two sets, what we end up with is just that portion of the number line which is covered by both of my sets, which would be that portion from negative 2 extending to the left only. Shade that in if I can't hear. Whoops. So there's a huge difference, isn't there, between or and and in how they behave, how they stick these two sets together to make one in my final answer. So ands were only looking for overlaps. Whereas for or, or acts like glue. Glue everything together. Okay. And take everything which belongs to either or, one of the sets or the other or both. And doing this step, I think, again, is the most subtle step in the whole process. We're still not done, unfortunately. We have one last thing to do in this problem. Um, but at this point, most of the mistakes that are going to be made in this problem have probably been made up to this point. So the last step is then to turn your answer into what we call interval notation. Interval notation is just a, a communication method. It's a way of expressing a final answer instead of using a picture, as we've done here, um, to express it using a kind of notation that specifies for an interval how far to the left on the number line does it go, how far to the right on the number line does it go, and do we include either or both of those endpoints. So our original question was the or, looking at this red set up here. Um, how would I express that set using interval notation? What did you do with your teams to make interval notation out of this answer? So let's start with 4. Okay. 4 is the rightmost endpoint in this set. There are no numbers in our set which are bigger than 4. So we're going to use 4 as part of our interval notation. It's the rightmost endpoint, so we're going to put it as the second number in a list that we call our interval. Um, and then, Helena, you said infinity. Where is that infinity coming from here? Right, so when you're making an interval, you're asking how far to the left on the numbered line does this set go and how far to the right? We know it goes as far right as the number four, but how far to the left does this set go? It goes on to the left forever. So when that happens, we'll use as our end point the symbol negative infinity. 
Remember, negative infinity isn't a number. Infinity is not a number. It's a concept. It's something that when you arrive in calculus, one of the big stories of calculus is what is infinity and how can we enfranchise the infinite in our calculations in mathematics. So we use negative infinity here just to express the idea that our set does not stop as we go to the left along this number line. It absolutely matters. So in interval notation, the order in which you write these two endpoints matters. Your greater endpoint should always be on the right. Your lesser endpoint should always be on the left. So this is one of the reasons why I like having the number line picture before you write your interval notation, because that will order your endpoints appropriately in the first place. My 4 and my negative infinity, if I look on my number line, are already in the right orientation. My negative infinity is on the left on the number line. My 4 is on the right on my number line. And that's how they survive into my notation. So now we've said how far to the left we go and how far to the right we go. The last piece of interval notation is specifying whether or not these endpoints are included in my set. So how do I do that? Let's start with the 4. Is 4 actually an element in my solution set, according to my picture? It's not, because on my picture I have an open circle. So how do we translate that into interval notation? What symbol do I use to say that 4 is not included? Yeah. We'll use a round parenthesis to indicate not included. So one of the little sort of dictionary things you can think of is that whenever you have an open circle on a number line, that will correlate to a parenthesis in your interval notation. Um, if, on the other hand, Let's say we were doing the, the and problem down here, where my interval would look like minus infinity to negative 2. On this example, negative 2 is included in my solution. So what symbol could I use there to indicate negative 2 is included? Bracket. Yeah. So closed circles on a sketch correlate with square brackets in your interval notation to indicate that we are including that number. So there's a big difference between those two. Make sure you keep those straight. How about negative infinity? What symbol does that get? Is negative infinity included in our set? So here's the thing about negative infinity. It's not a number. And because it's not a number, it can't be a part of any of the sets which are subsets of the real numbers that answer these problems. So infinities are pretty simple to remember. They always get round parentheses. Always, always. So you might have a bracket on one side but not on That's right. You could have a bracket on one side and a parenthesis on the other, for example, in this second solution here. Um, because we might include one endpoint and exclude the other one, um, particularly if one of those endpoints is an infinity. Because infinities and minus infinities will always get round parentheses, regardless of what's happening at the other end. So for the problem we were initially given, the nature of the answer that we would need is right there. The interval, which satisfies the compound inequality, 3w plus 5 is less than or equal to negative 1, or 4w plus 4 is less than 20, is, a mathematician would pronounce this as, the open interval from negative infinity to 4. We call it open because it's not including either the endpoint at negative infinity, which is not really an endpoint at all, or the endpoint at positive 4, which we're not including because we had an open circle here. And we had an open circle there because we had an open circle in our purple set. We had an open circle in our purple set because it was w less than 4. So one of the things I encourage you to use as a study aid in this course, just to kind of wrap up this example, is on the inside of the front cover of your workbook, you have this list of quick facts to know about each of the 10 modules in our course. And I find that interval notation is probably the easiest way to keep it straight is to just remember how the different symbols that you see in the process of solving your inequalities correlate to the different symbols that show up in your interval notation. So just as a last example, as we were saying before, strict inequality signs, less than or greater than, correlate on sketches on a number line to open circles, which correlate in interval notation to parentheses. Remembering that an infinity or a minus infinity will always get a parenthesis and not a square bracket. Whereas on the other hand, greater than or equal to and less than or equal to signs correlate to solid circles on a number line, which correlate to square brackets in your interval notation.